For most, Dmitry Bivol is a name that requires no introduction. For the minority who are unfamiliar with him, he has been ranked as a top five pound for pound boxer in the world for the last several years. Personally, with that in mind, I would say that he is still a bit underrated. In his signature win, he reduced Saul Canelo Alvarez to landing an average of just seven punches around. This video is going to focus on the strength and conditioning methods of Bivol. Bivol was born in the Soviet state, now known as Kyrgyzstan, and moved to Russia when he was 11. It is obvious when looking at Bivol's training footage that he makes use of many of the sports science concepts preached by the heavyweights of sports science from the Soviet Union. One of the main concepts Bivol makes use of is the implementation of specialized strength exercises in his strength and conditioning routine. You can see specialized strength exercises being done here for the javelin. To an extent, you can see that elements of the technique are replicated in the strength exercises. Personally, I think the adoption of the term special when referring to these types of exercise leads to some confusion. I'm going to briefly display the dictionary definition of a special on screen. There is definition one, which is to say, quote, better, greater, or otherwise different from what is usual, which is what I think people think of when they hear the term special. However, it is actually definition two, which I think comes closer to the mark, quote, belonging specifically to a particular person or place. Rephrasing the definition of special, I would say, quote, belonging specifically to a sports skill, unquote. To make sense of Bivol's exercise selection, you have to understand that in Soviet sports science, the goal of strength and conditioning is to do exercises that will enhance key skills, as opposed to lifting big numbers in one specific lift or developing beach muscles. Furthermore, as Dr. Yesis will describe, the goal of specialized strength exercises are twofold. We can use strength exercises that are specific to the neuromuscular patterning in the technique, which will then improve the technique and make you stronger at the same time. One of the most obvious combinations of strength with technique used by Bivol is his use of resistance bands whilst punching. That said, there are more subtle examples of this concept used throughout his training routine. To focus on the issue of bands, although a study looking at the cross and hook is not available, there is a study looking at a banded jab with a setup described as almost exactly the same as the one used by kickboxing champion Superbon here. Before going through this modern piece of research on banded jab training, which comes out of university in Belgrade, I'd first like to address some of the prior research out of the Soviet Union on the issue of mixing strength with technique. A tiny amount of the research that exists is referenced in Yuri Vygoshansky's Fundamentals of Special Strength Training in Sport. For example, Verkashansky cites a training study which showed that throwing a medicine ball that weighed 2 kg was more effective than throwing a ball that weighed 4 kg in terms of increasing maximum throwing distance in water polo players. They also found that the 4 kg ball started to have negative influences on technique. He also cites research looking at javelin training which found that 3 kg was the optimal weight for throwing the javelin in terms of optimizing technique and strength in the throw. So you can see from the study on water polo players that the Soviets were aware that mixing strength and technique could potentially have negative influences on technique. Despite this, they were also aware that mixing technique with strength could also improve the technique whilst also improving strength specific to the technique at the same time. Whilst you can, to an extent, gain a degree of understanding on the issue of mixing strength with technique by looking at the results of the training studies, I think it can also help someone get their head around the issue if they understand the theoretical basis behind the concept. In terms of its modern use, it would be fair to say that it starts with Nikolai Bernstein. Bernstein was a leading Soviet neuroscientist who was originally hired to study human walking 
to help with the engineering of pedestrian bridges. He would also be recruited to help refine large-scale manual labour tasks such as bricklaying. However, it was instead in the field of sports science where his work would make the biggest waves. Bernstein put forward the now pseudophobous theory of repetition without repetition, which is a key mode of performance principle which was used by Soviet sports scientists to dominate the sporting world from the 60s to the 80s. There are longer YouTube videos out there which get into the theory of repetition without repetition in depth. To do a brief description here, the idea is that in a sport, the internal and external conditions within the body will never be exactly the same. Therefore, no two roundhouse kicks thrown by a Thai boxer will ever be exactly identical. Neither will any two right hands thrown by a Marquis of Queensby Rules boxer. By extension, no two hip throws by a judo player will ever be identical, nor will any two arm bars from a jiu-jitsu player. This contrasts with other models of motor learning, where it's often described that the goal of training is to ingrain a skill into your muscle memory through countless repetitions, then execute this exact motor engram when the time arrives in your sport. Common sense supports Bernstein's work. For instance, if you watch a track and field event such as the long jump, elite competitors are not capable of predicting exactly where they're going to take off from on the takeoff board. Nor do they ever execute an exact jump of say 7 meters 32 centimeters. There's nearly always some degree of variability in jump distance by at least a few centimeters. Similarly, by more obtuse conceptualizations of motor learning, an elite basketball player who has practiced extensively would never miss a free throw, yet it clearly happens. So in terms of training implications, the goal of training if you are following Bernstein's philosophy is not to rep out identical movements, but rather to toggle with a movement pattern and subject it to disturbances as the muscle memory will need to be adaptable, as in a sporting context, the conditions for execution will never be exactly the same as the conditions for training. So next to look at the study which looked at banded punch training and specifically banded jab training. I'm going to get heavy on the details here which might make for a more boring video for those of a more casual interest but I think it's worth doing if you want to get to the bottom of this. I think this will also help those skeptical process the fact that strength and technique can be improved at the same time. You can see the study title here on screen. I have left a link to the study in the video description. It's an open access paper so anyone can read it if they want to examine it in further detail. So to focus briefly on the punch setup, to quote from the paper, the applied elastic resistance was the same for all subjects. It originated from rubber bands with one end externally fixed behind the subject while the subject held the other end by his punching hand. So as you can see, the study uses almost exactly the same setup as is used by Superbon here, with the band being held in his hand rather than attached around his waist, which is something some have said is critical for producing results. The first detail of the study which I'm going to single out is about the study participants. You can see that there are 40 different subjects, 14 from a kickboxing background, 13 from a savart background, and 13 from a boxing background. All of the participants were either members of the national junior team or national seniors team in their respective combat sports. They were also involved in regular training and had at least five years of martial arts training. The experience of the subject is a significant factor because when it comes on to the results, you will see that training improves lower body contribution to the punch. This would be less surprising in beginner subjects. In order to assess the contribution of different body segments, the authors note, four tightly secured reflecting markers were placed at the subject's body to record joint motion of specific joints. Specifically, they were placed over the bony landmarks of their dominant side wrist, elbow, shoulder and hip. If you want to get heavier on the anatomy and precisely locate the markers, the authors make use of some anatomical terms such as style of process of the radius, but I suspect for 90% watching, wrist is enough. The speed of the jab punch was measured before and after a six week training block, during a pad session after a warm up. In terms of training, the subjects train three times a week for six weeks. 
Specifically, the subjects perform six sets of 10 reps of the jab punch, with 10 seconds between punches and 60 seconds between sets. Each session was conducted at the end of their regular training session and lasted approximately 15 minutes. To look at the results, they can be seen here. As I said before, the paper is open access, so if you've made it to this point in the video, then I recommend either pausing the video to look at this graph, or using the link in the description, as this part is very significant. If you look at the key to the graph, you can see that the checkered boxes represent the pretest values, and the black boxes represent the post-test values. The top row looks at the limb velocity, and the bottom row looks at the extent of joint displacement. When you look at the top row, which looks at limb velocity, you can see that the difference between bars is greatest at the level of the wrist, with relatively minor changes in the speed of the hip. When you look at the bottom row, looking at the degree of limb displacement, you can see that there is a marked increase in the displacement of the hip in all groups except the control group, marked CG. So to refer back to Dr. Yes's claim. And here we can use strength exercises that are specific to the neuromuscular patterning in the technique, which will then improve the technique and make you stronger at the same time. The results of the study do seem to vindicate what he's been saying, as the speed of the punch has increased, indicating a strength and power benefit, and the degree of hip displacement has increased, indicating a refinement in the punching technique, with greater whole body contribution. That being said, Bevo does do a fair bit of normal exercises as well. It's taken me a fair bit of the video to explain the concept of specialized strength exercises, but they probably only make up a small proportion of Bevo's overall training time. Two notable exercises that Bevo tailors to be more specific to his fighting style are the landmine punch throw and also medicine ball throws. With the landmine punch throw, he recreates the jab technique. With medicine ball throws, you can see he assumes the boxing stance and you could say shadow boxes some movement. Beyond that, you can see he can be seen recreating both the jab and cross technique. Some people can be critical of a practice such as throwing a medicine ball as a jab on one side and a cross on the other, because in theory, it can create a muscle imbalance which could translate to an injury risk. Whilst the injury risk argument may be more persuasive right now as Bevo is currently injured, I think it's worth pointing out some counter arguments. Firstly, if you make your strength and conditioning routine too general, you won't have the specific physical abilities necessary to compete at a high level. Anyone who has seen a powerlifter new to boxing will typically see their theoretical strength won't even translate into a strong punch, much less anything else. Secondly, muscle imbalances don't necessarily guarantee injury. If you look at a racket sports player, a muscle imbalance is a guarantee, but they can still spend most of their time injury free. Thirdly, Bevo also spends a fair amount of time incorporating general exercises to correct muscle imbalances and avoid the repetitive strain that may come with specialization. Just to briefly touch on the subject of conditioning, so far this video has mostly focused on the strength and power side of things. However, I think it would be fair to say that Bevo is more of an endurance athlete. It's well known in sports science that endurance and power are a trade-off. In my opinion, by using a better selection of strength exercises, Bevo will be able to optimize both. Bevo says that he regularly runs, although he doesn't do it every day. Dimitri, do you also go running every morning? Uh, yeah, I, I, usually I, I do running, but not every day. He can also be seen doing high intensity interval training aside from his boxing training. This video could go on and on, but I'm going to finish it here. The final question that I'd like to ask you is to what extent is Bevo successful because of his strength and conditioning routine? And to what extent is he successful despite his strength and conditioning routine? Bevo can appear stiff and robotic, but he can also appear very disciplined. So it's debatable to what extent is he a natural talent, but it will also undoubtedly take a huge amount of technical boxing training to reach his level.